Oh, yeah. Come on, how do you think he made 5 foot 11 Mr. T look so gigantic? Arnold's only average height, too. Arnold, there's some controversy about that. There's people who say he's only 5'10, but he claims to be 6'2, and somebody claims that he's wearing shoe lifts. I've never seen 4 inch shoe lifts. How would you get your heel in? I'm 6'2. If I ever meet him, I'll tell you. I'll stand there and, you know, and it, you know, be obnoxious to him until he stands up until he gets down. Hi, I'm Gibbs. Let me kick this off. So, this is just a general concept I came up with a long list of general concepts. So, I'm basically, you know, trying to help out the, uh, I don't know, the community, I guess. That's a community thing. So, uh, I originally came up with this idea with a long list of other things. It's just at the top of my head. I didn't really develop it all that well. You know, so, uh, open to suggestions, uh, any kind of. Uh, Ideas you might have to flush this out a bit. So um, I just thought it'd be interesting. I've heard, you know, like these. I guess those are the public radio. They have these people on storytellers, and they have this set story that they would tell. And they, there was awards for it, and all kinds of, you know, stuff like that. Very cool. And uh, I thought, well, you know, pick a con, I do related pick a con to this game of mine, and maybe just do like an ad hoc type of, you know, storytelling thing. Um, We'll just make up the story and get going. So I thought, well, uh, you know, come up with some rules and what's the first rule I want to do? No rules. You know, just, you know, anything, anything goes. The idea is, you know, we're all grown ups and live with what our characters being heard or bagged up or whatever. So should paid professionals bow out of this? Well, so no, I, you know, just give us some guidance as well. Maybe you could, you know, interject some better ways of uh, telling the story as we go along. I don't know what I'm doing, so, you know, obviously I would benefit from, uh, you know, your experience and time in. I'm looking at this as a fun thing to do, but uh, I'm wondering if there's, you know, bigger implications for PaperCon as a whole. You know, there's a lot of technical stuff, there's a lot of people who do the written storytelling and uh, professionals and things like that. And I'm just looking for some way to you know, have some fun with it. Well, just remember that the uh, qualification to be a press, uh, professional writer is that you've actually been paid for your direct. Are you making a living from it? Oh, I could not feed myself. I don't make Stephen King money. I don't make Stephen King lunch money. I'm hoping that'll go up with each successive book. My next one comes out next month. Uh, the Hospitalism Affair. No relation to fuzzies. I'm currently working on another goddamn. I'm starting to feel like Piper did. I'm starting to want to strangle some fuzzies. I've been banging away at fuzzies for like four years, and it's not as much fun as it sounds. <laughs> wow, banging okay. fuzzies. <laughs> so, did you have a diminutive hair suit aliens? So what I was thinking of a science fiction, right? right. And so I, was, you know, I, I could come up with a, a plot line and start us off on something like that, or um, you know, go around the room or just jump around. I mean, the format is really wide open here. I'm thinking, well, maybe if we don't know what to do, we'll you know, throw up with a few sentences that gets us going, right? Mm -hmm. We'll pass, pass the time one way or the other, something like that. And you know, if you, if you don't feel you have a clear understanding of what you want to say, you just pass it to the next person in line. Or we can jump around the room and get ready with this. I've got a video. We're, we're, we're taping right now. Thank God. <laughs> I hate writing. I'm all keyboard. Yeah. yeah. So I'll probably throw this up on uh, YouTube. And, I'm not sure exactly how I'll let everybody know where it was. Um, you, know, you can get it to me, communications at pingopound.org, um, and then I can give it out to the. Oh, wow. Someone who's actually official. That's cool. There's yeah, when you go to pingopound.org, I'm the fat guy holding the lightsaber when the, when you first start scrolling through the page. Yeah. Oh. And you wonder where you've seen me before. <laughs> we at least had a rule of no time travel. I'm, I'm going to second that. I am going to second that. It's time travel session combo. <laughs> time travel should never be a first writing project. <laughs> All right, so if we want to do like some limits, maybe we just like we want to stay in the solar system and say we haven't gotten to light speed mm -hmm. we're in the solar system. Oh, you can go through the omniverse as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so do we want to you know, allow for we want, alternate universes? Well, do we want to resurrection? I would, I, I would be a fan of hard science fiction. All right. Okay, so we got to answer Conceivable here. within the next couple right. of hundred okay. years or. Or, you know, I mean, well, I read a lot of 
transhuman stuff that's really in hard assignments. So get kind of transhuman? Yeah, so the idea of uh, uh, one day, we'll, you know, it's the idea you'd be able to load up your consciousness into a computer and that, you know, Transcendence? you'll never die. Yeah, yeah, exactly, kind of that kind of stuff. But the idea of space travel isn't uh, you physically going somewhere, you okay. radio cast your ego out out to, you know, Jupiter. Just like, and it, like you can have a machine or something. 3D you know. print, yeah. yeah. Yeah, machines would have had a little bit sent off decades or yeah. generations before. But does that count as traveling? I never asked that. Does that count? If you don't have to go? Yeah, part of you does go because you you, goes and you're where, like, what your essence is went, yeah, but, but you're still there. So it's like VR. But if you're, even if your physical body doesn't go, if your consciousness goes, Traveling is all about the experience, so you're still experiencing what you're, what you're, wherever you are. Hmm. Think total recall, only it's real time action. Oh. Sorry, sorry. So I like the idea of hard sciences too. There's a lot of really cool stuff that's happening right now, like um, 3D printing of organs. That is actually well, right. Yeah. 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 Cyborg, is that, you know, brain interface to control the body? Yes, they've actually done that. Now, there is a drawback to what you suggest. How do you get past the lag? I mean, you're going at the speed of light between here and Jupiter. You're going to be something like half an hour waiting for this thing to pick up the pencil you told it to. Yeah, well, so they have an actual study, an actual event where they took a, like a brain, uh, you know, something that works on thought sent it around to the other side of Earth and back, and it took less time than the natural signal from your brain to your foot. Uh, that one was, I think, at 256 miles a second. Well, the, the, current, the current thought was that you would, you would cast your ego into whatever machine or whatever you're going to have it. Astral body? Yes. You, and actually, so you would be inhabiting that yeah. machine so there's a, there's a philosophical thing there too because you had your original ego right. and now this new ego. That there's separate people then. Yes. Well, is it? Yeah. Is it? Do we want to? Well, are, are you saying the ego and the super ego, or are you just? I mean, I mean that's one that's one area where you could go with it. Absolutely. Because if your super ego is not there, so then you do like. So you're xeroxing your yeah psycho your psycho makeup. Yeah, they call it they call it uh, forking. Right. You basically so split. You take the forks back together. Yeah. Prisoners that gets around the line. Yeah. And, and filter what they think, right? Yeah. yeah. Psychosurgery. That's another concept in sciences. So cool. Well, let me, let me start off with a, like a, a brief. Uh, this is just a storyline I came up with just for fun. So uh, uh, let's call uh, the character Max. Max is sitting at his desk, uh, you know, cubicle farm. He's got these implants and all kinds of wonderful optical controls and he's looking at these three-dimensional displays of the, the network in the solar system. And he's responding to outages here and there and, and taking corrective actions and getting teams of people to fix various physical problems out of the real world. And he basically gets a call from someone we'll call the old man. So Max gets this call from the old man saying, hey, there's a I don't know, oot cloud, there's, how do you pronounce that? Oort. Oort. Oort cloud, oot. there's a, you know, there's a outage and it looks like there's some fanatic out there who's tearing down the infrastructure and somebody needs to go out there and, you know, correct this somehow. So he doesn't like, you know, the, the field trips and stuff like that, but he's got to do something, you know, every once in a while for the old man because he really helped him out a lot. And uh, so basically he tells us, the guy gets to do hey, I'm taking off, take over my work while I'm gone, and the guy's complaining, well, you know, you can't do that. If you leave, then there's only one, one person in the building, and the rule is if you have fewer than two people in the physical building, they, they knock your building down. But he leaves anywhere, and, and he goes, and he's uh, walking there, and an automated car comes up, and it's got like a, uh, a person, an elderly person who's like vegetative, and sitting in the front seat because it was laws written back in the 21st century saying that, you have the physical person in the vehicle when you're driving, you know, on a public road. And so the, the vehicle asks him if he needs a ride, and he says, you know, he declines that. Almost gets hit going across a railroad track where a bicycle train comes in. It's his buddy's house uh, called Joe. And Joe he has all these physical devices and mechanical things that prevent him from getting into the building until the 
machine recognizes some of the patterns of the habits he has as he's trying to get that freedom. Yeah. Finally lives in there and uh, Joe and his uh, that, uh, and some other person there that uh, is, looks like a female uh, is then uh, going to the, uh, the space port and they get there and there's like an old machine that they, they're met by uh, one of Max's uh, a lady friend and they jump on the spacecraft and start to the, uh, find, you know, head to the, uh, to, and they're going to stop at a restaurant on the way in the middle of Jupiter or something like that. So I'm going to take it from there. Me? Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay, so if they're, so, okay, if we're going to the higher hard science angle then, so it's going to be, it's a fairly slow trip then to Jupiter. So imagine there's got to be some hyperspace, stuff involved, they're going, or cold sleep, or cold sleep, something to slow down their metabolism, because otherwise it, you know, it's going to take, what, years, a couple of months for them to get to Jupiter, so, um, if you caught, if you're talking a lot further up. Right. That begs the question of what the form of uh, propulsive force is. Are yeah. we talking atomic? Are we talking solid fuel? Does it work on gravitational? Reach out, grab something. So to me, I mean, you want me to make that part up? I'll say, okay, it has to do with some device that can sense gravity uh, and turn off directionalness of gravity, and so now you have a pole. And it's a, a constant and increasing pull as you, you move through. So, new concept. Okay. Um, I can see that getting up to half the speed of light. So, you can make the trip from Terra to Jupiter in about 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, so, say so they stop, stop near the rings of Saturn. They're, they're, they're doing this to, you know. Kind of like when the tour bus pulls over on the side of the Grand Canyon and they're you know, looking at the rings of Saturn. Um, you do know you went past Jupiter, right? Okay. Maybe we'll say it's... Santa Crop! Santa Crop, yeah. Well, they're, they're going on some gravitational... Like some or something, I don't know. Um, so they stop near they get out to the Oort Cloud and Max looks out and sees that the problem isn't another human being but an AI that has gone bonkers. Wow, rogue. Gone rogue. The AI is non-communicative and what else can I make up? <laughs> I don't know, but pass it off to you. Uh, well, this guy going to see what's going on, obviously he's going to have some technical background. You find out you got a rogue AI, the first thing you want to find out is A, is it dangerous, B, is it going to kill me, and C, am I going to be able to fix it? Not have time for it, though, don't we? Although yeah, I have a little story. You know, I mean, yeah, it's a rogue. It's, uh, do we have Asimov's laws in this universe? Okay, um, first law is not applying, so he's got some serious damage to his uh, positronic cortex, all right? Doesn't recognize a human being as a human being, so he's thinking, okay, I'm the fly swatter, guess what you are? And uh, running and screaming is very much involved. Um, Lacking Dr. Busonic's screwdriver, he has to pick through such tools as he has, looking for weak spots. Uh, he has a friend with him? A lady friend. Lady friend. And of course, she keeps tripping and getting in the way, so he has to pick her up and run, and this wears him out because, damn, <laughs> tripping his tools. Sorry. Sorry, digging up the old troll. You know, and even Rose Tyler tripped once in a while. When it comes around to you, you can fix that. Okay. Yeah, feel free. Um, but yeah, right now his primary situation is trying to get close enough to the thing to fix it without getting fly slide. Go. Um, okay. So he's at the communication station in the Oort cloud that's connecting the galactic system, and they're keep looking around, and their head um, 
neural interface, you know, it's bringing up data. If I'm looking at this rock, the store data says, well, it's this, you know, carbosilicate, it's this, you know. And whenever the AI goes through, you can see the glow from the circuits activating, but then there's no more data. It doesn't say, well, the circuit was installed at this point. It doesn't say it's as if it's being replaced and it's not um, into that system yet. While he sets, um, we're going to call her Julie, down, and they continue to run and they're heading to the main frame of the system to see if something's been interfaced that shouldn't, they start getting a um, message is in the male sector of the cybernetic core. They have, and it's, well, open this, open this, and you know, it looks like junk mail, but they choose to ignore it until they keep going and going. Meanwhile, the station's getting darker and then lighting up as they're about a hundred foot interval behind them. Alright, uh, let's see. Can I, can I recap where we are? So there was a, so there was a, a, a <coughs> Max is, is our guy who's trying to fix this outage. Let me jump over the two of them. That is one of Oh, Joe came with him. Yeah, that's it. Okay, okay. So, so, so it's Max, Joe, and Julie. Yeah. Um, they they made a they stopped by Brings to Saturn to have a meal and see the see the tourists and then uh, World AI and uh, running screaming running and screaming. Uh, Were they flying and or running? <laughs> and uh, and then it's something that looks like John Fail. Uh, something that looks like jumping in over distance. Yeah, it's in the back of their cybernetics. They're getting this message, but it just looks like junk mail, so they're ignoring it while they're trying to get to the main frame. Okay. Roger. Okay. Um, so, uh, I'm, going, I'm going to say that uh, Joe being, being uh, better at physical confrontation than Max is, uh, says that he if if he can get if he can access the physical brain of the rogue AI um, that he might be able to do something. And so uh, let's see you said they were in the room. Um I figure it's like a complex and they're heading towards the main brain. Or whatever like the core passages it is to see if something's been introduced. A quarter of shafts. Lots of stuff to Okay, okay, okay. Um so so Joe stops and turns around, um, and he he tells Max that he needs that he needs Max's skills at like interface that he can do the physical. Max needs to do like uh, the the technical side of it, and um, Max tells him that he's crazy and uh, takes off, continues to run. Um, Drag, uh, uh, Julie stays with Joe, and uh, together they're going to face down this this rogue uh, AI while Max has hightailed it, presumably to try to fix, find the core of this problem. Right. So, um, Julie and Joe are now going to be facing down this AI. Um, in a more physical manner, but uh, while uh, Max is headed down towards the mainframe, that piece of, of mail that keeps coming through, he finally decides that he's going to take a look at it and realizes that it's not really junk mail, that um, it's a warning from the old man that he knows that the system's been compromised, he knows who's at fault, and that everybody's in great danger um, because what the AI is programmed to do is essentially um, send a virus through all of these neural links that everybody has and, and fry everybody's brain. And so um, he tries to get a message to Joe and to Julie to try not to, to have them not interface with the AI because if they aggravate it, then they'll accelerate the timeline. So Julie, 
not realizing this in time, had interfaced with a portion of the door that would uh, be connected directly to the mainframe, and now she's got this corruption in her, and she's starting to suffer from symptoms that look like you know, a bad flu, and she's not sure what's going on. And she's also got this awareness now, somehow back deep in, in her mind, that there was a, a person in this station who was the the model of the the um, the AI who who was the basis for the intelligence, and that person had been involved in some situation where his mother was you know, having cancer and didn't like uh, technology because the cancer treatments were harmful and hurt hurt her a lot, and so this entity, this person from that was the basis of this uh, AI environment basically wanted to wreak havoc with the system and so he introduced the virus on purpose to try to bring down the mainframe and shut down the system. <coughs> so now you take it. So Julie is showing symptoms of some? Sort? Yes. So it, it, <coughs> the system somehow produced some physical effects onto her? Yes. Okay, and why why are we after this AI anyway? What did it do to provoke Max, Joe, and Julie? It, it shut it. down the, the network in this region. And that's like the sector of space kind of yeah, this, thing? Yeah, this area of, right. Okay. And, you know, it's, it's Max's job to fix things like that. Oh, okay, okay. So yeah. he's not just like... No, no, he's, he's a technician. Okay, so Max is a technician. Joe is the more physical, is it's like a bodyguard or work. So Joe and Julie have went off and tried to perhaps fight through its defenses to the center of the decor of the, the matrix where maybe they can destruct it or break it down. As, as they're heading towards this, Julie starts to show symptoms of, of some form of physical symptoms that have been provoked by, um, say as a defense mechanism, the AI has released uh, nanites, um, a small little robots that have sort of took, went into her and have, have Provoke yeah. peace and enter her, thank you. And so that's why she is showing them symptoms, and Ju Joe is not for some reason. Um, the nanites, as she's starting to get slightly fluish, um, uh, feverish, if you would, nauseous, um, and starting to lose a little bit of motor control, do things that she wouldn't normally do. Um, as, as they're running down hallways and up and down ladders, she's starting to lose her motor skills. Um, she basically is losing control of herself. The AIs are making her move in their way. She came back in for me to recap. Just like super quick, 20 seconds. I, I have pretty much no idea what's going on, so you guys are going to have to tell her. And then I'll All right. Um, the main picture <coughs> of Max is like a system fixer um, person for the solar system, and he gets a report from one of his contacts, the old man that there's this sector in the Oort cloud that's going dark. So first he goes to his friend Joe's, who's also a technician guy for production. They go on the um, female friend Julie. They go, they stop at Saturn for lunch. They get to the spot in the Oort cloud, and they find out it's a rogue AI doing all the damage. Um, they, you know, it's not responding to the three laws. So they decided to run screaming this happened. Um, for some reason Julie tripped, maybe it was the early effects of the nanites. Um, they start getting a message in their cybernetic mail thing in their head saying it looks like junk mail, so they kind of ignore it. They keep going, um, the party split a little bit. <laughs> Um, Julie and Joe are going to confront the AI. Max keeps running to the floor and trying to figure out what's happening. Max opens up the mail that he thought was junk mail, and it's the old man telling him the oh, yeah, last bit. Virus. Oh, it's a virus that's basically destroying everything. It, it'll fry out the. the yeah, it'll hurt. It'll um, yeah, destroy the cybernetics in the brain. And um, then they found out it was from one, based on one of the guys that worked there that his mom got really sick. And that's kind of where the virus originated and was the motive behind it. Sorry. I got a little mixed up in general. Yeah. I said that the, the, the AI released nanites and, and Julie is losing okay. her control, the ability but to control she, herself. She started to show flu symptems. And, yeah. But if you lose the cybernetics, then 
that just make her like a regular human, or is that like that she's already? We 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 haven't gotten to that point. You can have cyber. You tell us. Yeah, well, I just felt like the I didn't know what we were doing there with that. Time. So that that's a well, good that, thing that we could play with, right? Yeah, I don't yeah. know. This is like a cerebral computer that was implanted, not... Yeah, uh, so if she loses it, it's not like she's dead. Well, it affected no. her equilibrium because she tried to... Okay. Uh, she tries to scratch her nose and does this instead. <laughs> Basically, it's taking control of her. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah, her immune response. The nanites. So, as nanites... I'm going to call nanites. As nanites are taking control of her, she starts yeah. realizing that she can hear Joe's thoughts. Um, and Joe's thoughts, she's, she's known Joe for a long time, and it's starting to seem like the thoughts that she's hearing from Joe's aren't really his thoughts. And she's starting to realize that Joe is actually the cyborg himself. And she's starting to wonder how long she has, or how long um, Joe and Max have been friends for. She doesn't know Joe all that well. We've only known each other for like a year or two. Um, and she's trying to warn Max but Max still has all that junk mail going through his system, and he's still trying to figure out what's going on. And because of the nanite, she's completely lost control of her bodily functions. So she's kind of like jerking around and blah, blah, blah. And she looks at Joe, and Joe looks at her, and Joe can tell. Joe can tell that she knows, and then she, he decides that she, he must kill Julie. Because if Julie tells Max, then Max will know that Joe is a part of this whole conspiracy, and that AI and Joe can hear each other's stuff as well. Like the board. I don't know if you guys are Oh, come on. Yeah. You're not in the right place. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, so, so, through mind control, Joe controls, not mind control, but Joe can control the little nanites and they start attacking her brain and her stuff. Yeah, they have control and her um, blah, 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 the cybernetic implants. So, so he, he, he starts. He, he tells the nano approach to start killing him, to start killing Julie, and then he starts talking to the um, AI through you know their little interface, and he thinks that the nano probes are killing Julie, but she's kind of fighting back. But he doesn't realize it because he thinks that he's like so good at the nano probes and killing people, and that's all. Combat. Combat. Nano way nano. Is that good? <laughs> okay, so, uh, so Joe's, a, Joe's a cyborg. Okay, so uh, as Joe gets to the mainframe, uh, the, the AI reveals that it knows why Joe is there, that the old man actually sent Joe there on a mission to get the communication relays back up so that they can digitally send this virus, which is what it's both digital and it um, you know works like a how a biological virus would work, but it just instead of dominating the body, it takes over all the cybernetic and nanotechnology, and that's how it kills um, its host. So upon realizing that, realizing why he was really sent there, um, he realizes that he's got to get rid of the others. So, with the aid of the AI, he finds an area of the space station or ship or wherever they're at, and he proceeds to open the airlocks. And basically, he's going to flush them out. And he's a cyborg, so he doesn't need to breathe. That's all an illusion, part of his programming. And he's going to reconnect the communication relays, and they're going to be in this, this little bugger back to Earth. Julie, realizing that something's infecting her, realizes the only way, and she's terrified of it, is to turn off all of her cybernetic connections that have, it's, it's like us now not having our smartphones. Oh my god, but, but a hundred thousand times worse. She's got to go blind, plain human, for the first time in her life. And she's got to do that, unconnected, has to try to accomplish the mission. Oh, this is what you're handing me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> so Julie based, is uh, mentally stumbling around trying to manage in a situation where a normal human was never designed to be. You know, you're up in a space station circling a very large, unpleasant planet, and oh, wait, is that an air?